Posture, and we're live. Awesome. Hello. Oh, yeah. What's up? Median. What's up? Andrew Havoc, thank you for joining me, sir. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, right off the bat, I gotta know, I hate to be a spoiler, is Havoc the actual last name? Legally, yes. Originally, okay. no. Um, All right. So, like, I just recently got the name changed last year. It's not, like, on my driver's license or anything, but it does turn out that the bank really doesn't care when they're putting it on a debit card. So my debit card does say Andrew Havoc on it. That's badass. Uh, yeah, because my original last name actually wouldn't fit on the debit card. So they were like, well, we can just shorten it to W or something. And I was like, if I can put whatever I want on it, if it doesn't matter, can you just put Andrew Havoc? And they're like, yeah, I guess so. I was like, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so your actual last name wouldn't fit on a debit card? No, it is Weberdink, which I believe is like freaking 12 characters or something. Um, w. So huh? That's E-I or I-E? I-E. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Kind of goes I, uh, Well, I guess that makes sense. I would have said Weber if it was the other way. I suppose so. It's Dutch, so like definitely... So, I mean, the name Weberdank, was that kind to you through school or? I was actually homeschooled. So okay. every everybody at my school had the same last name. So it <laughs> evened out. Yeah, um, like, that's a good one. Yeah. They, yeah. Uh, Boy Scouts wasn't as kind, but. <laughs> okay. When did we start Boy Scouts? Uh, it was Cub Scouts at first, which was like, I don't know probably like nine or 10 and then into boy scouts at like 13 i think it changes over and that was where i got almost all of my social interaction when i was a child and like it's a weird place to get social interaction man <laughs> is there something you wanted to do or you were encouraged to do i only really wanted to do it for interacting socially with everybody um i didn't really care about camping or like any of the stuff. Although a lot of it I have found has come in handy in my life now, like just being able to tie a simple knot and have it like work and be, yeah. you know, a good knot is surprisingly useful. Uh, absolutely. I kind of wish like looking back on it, I had been in like boy scouts and learned all those survival stuff, especially with us, you know, getting nuked at any moment now. Yeah, uh, as far as that goes, I would just hope to be like at the center of it when it <laughs> happens. I don't really have a whole lot of interest in sticking around after the apocalypse. I know it sounds cool to like everybody and everybody loves Fallout and all that, but like, I don't think I'd be that good at it. Yeah, don't you think there are a lot of people kind of like wishing Fallout would happen? Too many, way too many. <laughs> have you personally like heard people actually say it? Not, well, I think probably one or two people. Yeah, the, like, really big gun collectors, the, like, <laughs> you know, that type of person that they're, like, already prepping for it anyway. And it's like, ah, oh, man, I think they just want to return on investment at some point. How long would you give yourself in a doomsday scenario? I don't know. It depends on the scenario, obviously. So, yeah. like say we get nuked by russia and like i what what is it a bunker or do is it just we're just in the wilderness all of a sudden i mean you're you're you right now like yeah how do you think how long do you think What's your <laughs> um finding somebody who's more prepared probably yeah. going to one oh, of those yeah. people's houses and being like hey you know me right like you remember <laughs> we hung out you have a lot of canned goods, right? Do you know any of your neighbors? Uh, like, I've waved at the people across the street. And then, like, I think the guy down the other way asked me to, like, move my car at one point. But <laughs> other than that, no, not really. That's the thing. Like, you watch all those prepper shows and, they, you know, the people who are really ready, have they live in, like, a cul-de-sac and they all know each other and they're, like, you know... Yeah, they, they hide each other's you know magazines under each other's beds and stuff just in case. So yeah, 
I, I like you said, uh, I've seen my neighbors drive by uh, a couple times. You know, I think I've seen a few outside, but no real interaction. <laughs> right. Yeah. Do you wish you knew your neighbors better or you don't really care? I, I don't know. There was one guy who came by. Oh, God, I wish I could remember his name. I only met him the one time. Steve What's that? Steve McCooch. Steve McCooch. That's right. That's the guy's <laughs> name. Uh, he, McCooch. Yeah, he came by one day. He is notorious in the neighborhood for like picking up people's junk or stuff that they put on the road and like just bringing it to his yard. And like you could like go to his yard and just see all your old stuff just sitting there. <laughs> and he never did anything with any of it, but he would just collect. And um, just recently, there was like an eviction notice and stuff on his door. But like when he came by, he was telling me about how like. The city of Augusta fertilizes with cow shit, so they make magic mushrooms grow everywhere. And he was telling me about this spot where I could go and pick magic mushrooms, talk about how the CIA was after him. And then he started talking about this Hooters waitress that he used to have a crush on who had a kid that he ended up babysitting at some point. And he showed the kid Finding Nemo, but before it was released in the movie theaters. And I'm like, see, that's the part I don't believe. <laughs> Dude, those guys are the best i love guys with stories like that yeah i told you know you come to the worst mic. is like the servers and the bartenders and you know the waitresses they get it the worst because you got those old men at like golden corral with all their old war stories and they're usually either like completely made up or like they're other people's stories that they're using as their own uh, it's just hilarious yeah i would think you know uh, it's all part of the job. Some some are true. Sometimes you just want to sit down with those people, especially for you people like you and I, and uh, get some real material out of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, there was this uh, older guy that lived next door to me before when I lived at um, with my sibling. And it was townhouses. So, like, you kind of know your neighbor a little bit better when it's, like, literally sharing a wall. And uh, he was an older guy named Ray, and he would talk your freaking ear off i always said at one point like i should probably get him on a podcast just because it would be a four-hour freaking podcast of him just telling stories from you know the good old days is ray a, uh, ray a foreigner nope no uh white guy ex-military ah um, domestic yeah ah good old bud light yeah <laughs> yeah he he was probably, I don't know, like a little easier to get along to along with than your typical like 60, 70 year old white male that is ex-military. But um, it was just that his stories were so it just took him so long to get to the point. <laughs> don't you love that? Just all fluff and no right. no punchline. Yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> actual content whatsoever. <laughs> Dude, those guys, oh man, I remember, uh, you know, you go on a road trip with someone like that, and so you can't get out, like, there's no escape, you're just in the car, it's infuriating, like, a guy's, so uh, I went to the store with my wife the other day, and, uh, you know, we were looking at carpets, and it's like, okay, and it's just, you know, it's one of those guys, you're like, dude, this is never gonna end, god damn, but, you know, that happens, uh, you're gonna meet those kind of people, especially you, uh, right. are you a native Augustine? I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but okay. moved here when I was like six years old. So pretty uh, much. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you, so that would put you, did you like start kindergarten? You started school here? I mean, homeschool first through 12th grade, the whole oh, thing. I forgot. That's right. Yeah. 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 I did go to kinder or uh, preschool in Michigan. I did a uh, like public preschool thing that I vaguely remember a little bit. Um, but other than that, just homeschool the whole time. So how many siblings do you have? Seven. Seven siblings. Okay. Yeah. So we're talking grades one through seven at least. Oh yeah. Yeah. My youngest sibling, my older brother, I'm the second oldest. So my older brother is a year and a half older than me, making him like 30 years old. And then my youngest sibling is 12 right now. Oh, dang. So, yeah. So yeah. you said you're the eldest or you're not the eldest? Second oldest. Second oldest. Okay. Yep. 
So, wow. That's, what is that like? I mean, being on the elder spectrum of the kids, I mean, they're all into the weird shit these days that we have no idea about. Like, <laughs> yeah. What is that like? I, I wouldn't want to be first. <laughs> I can say that for sure. I don't want to be the first one because that just seems like too much to live up to. Um, and then, I don't know. I feel like I am glad that I was a little bit older because I was able to get out of the house before things got like really crazy with my parents. Cause they got divorced shortly mm. after, or like not even that long ago. And, um, mm. it just like all of my youngest siblings are still like having to live with them through the whole thing and decide, you know, which house do I want to be at and who's, you know, like, as much as you can try and have a divorce be like not picking sides, there's always going to be some picking sides. That's just how splitting things up works. Oh, yeah. Especially when you're young and your ego is kind of like in a different place. Or you're like, oh, which parent's nicest to me? Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, it was, I mean, was that kind of a, was it a surprise to you or not really at this point? I mean... It was a little more a surprise to me than it was to the other kids because I, A, probably wasn't paying very close attention when I was a kid to their relationship, and then B, was out of the house since I've been 18. So, like, I didn't really have that close of a, you know, relationship with my parents for that period of time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is it a situation, like, where they're, like, cool or not really? Um, so like the, my dad's a pastor bit is like not even that much of a bit. It's just that he is a pastor <laughs> and like, he is very, um, very strictly down that path. Like he does not, um, he doesn't believe in dinosaurs, which is just interesting in and of well, itself. The, he, the fossils are like, we made them up. He's one of those. They're, they're a test. Okay. <laughs> it's God testing you. All right. Hey, uh, who am I? Yep. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but uh, that and I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff. But my mom, my mom's pretty cool. She uh, <clears throat> she got a lot more relaxed about things after the divorce, whereas you know my parents were really really strict for basically my entire life and then as soon as the divorce happens it's just like no rules for i mean there is but it's it's always complicated oh yeah because i mean like you're kind of playing one against the other and you're aware of it and like they're going through all the not i mean especially a, a divorced pastor that's like a you know that's like a cop who shot someone you know what i'm saying <laughs> no 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 you know what i'm saying yeah, but don't, like, I feel like most cops end up shooting someone, right? <laughs> or, I, I don't know, maybe not most, but... It is It is something, like, the news makes it so, you know, obviously they're going to accentuate, exaggerate, do what they have to. Like, obviously those stories are real, but to right. think about, like, the amount of police interactions in a day, and then the, the shootings that we hear about, I don't know. I'm sure that the the ratio is definitely on the side of shootings not happening. <laughs> but, yeah, probably. Uh, the ones that stand out stand out, you know. Yeah. But yeah, sure. so I mean, is that something that like he wrestles with, like the divorce pastor thing, or it's, it's kind of like cool amongst his flock? Well, both of them are remarried now. So okay. I have and it's been I it between the two of them, I think it took about two to one to two years to get remarried again, which, you know, to each their own. Uh, my, uh, my stepdad seems really cool. My stepmom doesn't really like the rest of the family. So that's a little <laughs> weird, but um, I don't know exactly how his like whole church life or acceptance among that crowd is, or I know he, goes around to different churches preaching now he doesn't have one particular one that he's preaching at but uh oh he's on tour yeah right <laughs> he's a road preacher nice 
I've always said that preachers were just comedians for Jesus. I couldn't agree more, man. They love the stage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you can definitely tell, um, like, when I was growing up, my dad, you know, on at the pulpit, on stage, whatever. It was... I doing comedy now i see like exactly what he was doing yeah you just wanted the attention i was actually trying to work out a bit the other day about how <laughs> people singing in church is bless basically you. just that was britney she said <laughs> bless you Thank you. um but how people singing in church is just like karaoke for people who don't want to like you know sing devil music right <clears throat> it's like nobody's gonna judge you just sing your heart out like and preachers love to get a laugh too. They, their face lights up when the crowd oh, laughs. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really something. But then they can bring it down too and be real serious. I mean, it's it's a powerful position up there. Yeah, and everybody has to listen to you. I think that's the main like important part about being on stage, like being a comedian or a musician or whatever it is. Is you're forcing everyone to listen to you. But you know, like. Ideally, most people have like paid to be there, but so you're not technically forcing them, but like you're presenting this entire situation where they're all facing your way and there's a big light on you and you have speakers projecting your voice and no one else's. So, oh, yeah, it's funny, like in my lifetime, how much has changed the amount of people who just go to church uh, from now. I feel like more people are like, I'm comfortable, you know being religious from home type of thing. Like I feel like it's much less people are a little less strict, a little more loosey goosey about their faith, you know? Well, and COVID like you couldn't go to church. You had to go to church <laughs> yeah. from home. That's a good point. And at that point, like you either admit that this whole going to church thing was a ruse in the first place of like, we have to be at this specific building at this specific time, on this specific day or, or <laughs> God does have this handled and you all just keep going to church anyway in hopes that God is real and all powerful and can protect you from COVID because yeah. why, if it was that important that you go to church, he would, he would make it okay, right? Like, he's not going <laughs> to... Uh, and what's funny, too, is, like, especially being down here, because I'm from um, I'm from upstate New York, so, like, the size of the churches are a lot different. So, hey, TJ in the house with the pie or the cake. Oh, my God. What's the... Uh, what is the answer on that one? What's your preference there? Pie or cake? We got to know. Uh, let's see. Definitely pie. I okay, kind of, definitely I kind, of, I kind of do not like cake very much at all. It has to be a really good cake for me to like cake. And then um, pies, I'll, I'll eat pretty much any kind of pie. So, What about like an ice cream cake? Ice cream cakes are better than okay. regular cakes. I will give it that. Yeah, especially like that Oreo one from Dairy Queen or whatever. That, <laughs> yeah. So... You know, as far as the preachers go, I used to be, you know, I feel like it's pretty typical and not all people are this way. But, you know, when you're young, you go through this period of like, yeah, fuck religion is so stupid and I'm going to bash it all the time. Like I went through that of like posting all this shit online. But now I realize, I mean, no matter what I want to believe, like it, if it's helping them at the end of the day and not hurting anyone, then, yeah. you know, I mean, why, why talk a bunch of shit about it? Just let it work for them. And it does work for a lot of people. Yeah. It's just so ripe for the jokes. Oh. I know. I know. If it was a different time, I mean, it wouldn't be so easy to be like, I mean, if they want to do the Crusades, who cares? You know? Yeah. Right. So it is, it's true. It's been sanitized over the years, but I don't know. And it's funny too, like even, even in politics, you know, like a staunch conservative now is, has to be like, so the gays get married. Who cares? You know, it's right. funny yeah, how that has happened. Yeah, you even as like a Christian now, you're not, you're still not allowed to hate gay people <laughs> unless you're Chick Fil A. So like, you either make delicious food or you love gay people. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, TJ coming back. We got the Super Nintendo or Sega. Super Nintendo. Mm. I've been sucking Nintendo's dick since I was like eight years old. 
<laughs> I never got the super. I had the original. I had Mario and the duck hunting game, but I never got the super. Did you have I the had, duck hunting game? I did not have duck hunt. I didn't actually own a NES or a Super Nintendo. I had friends that had them. Okay. And um, there was one point when my friend let me borrow his because my mom had taken away my Game Boy. So I was grounded from that. But my buddy was like, there's no rules against Super Nintendo. She said she didn't say anything about a Super Nintendo. I was like, you know what? You're right. She didn't. So <laughs> I was able to borrow his Super Nintendo and uh, Super Mario World. Just incredible. And A Link to the Past. Come on. Did you watch the Mario movie? The old like cartoon one or the live not the action cartoon one though yeah the live action one i did not but i have seen multiple youtube videos about it oh, yeah. um describing showing clips everything like that you gotta catch it it's a classic it's one of those like if you haven't seen the original you know teenage mutant ninja turtles like you, right. you gotta catch it oh, have yeah. you seen those i have seen those i actually um i used to work at a place called bricks for kids and we would do uh, movies during lunchtime because that's the best way to get yeah. kids to act in a regular organized way is to just put something on the fucking TV and they'll all just sit there and eat their lunch for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that is very true. A lot of times it was just a DVD player. So I would just pirate movies and burn them on DVD and I bring in, you know, like the good movies because like, you know, there are good kids movies. I have no um, doubts about that in my mind, but uh, TMNT three turtles in time was definitely on that list. The, the latest movies have been pretty badass, like with the graphics and stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Graphics. Yeah. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Listen to me talk like I know anything. Yeah, the graphics are so cool. But yeah. All the CGI and stuff, the shredder. Cause you right. can really, I mean, think of the remakes that have happened. You can really, fuck up a movie if you don't know what you're doing so i've been surprised to see like because the originals were cult classics yeah and you can look at fast and furious you can take a pretty good original movie and make it ridiculous by the end so right now going back to the uh religious aspect of it were you ever like going to church every sunday into it sort of thing oh yeah yeah my whole childhood until like um so, like, I moved out at 18, but I still kind of held on to a little bit of the religious stuff I didn't know for sure. And then I started, like, learning about space <laughs> and <laughs> learning about, you know, how long the Earth has been around. And I was like, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. If this is all, like, I feel like that's why most religious people only want their kids to go to like Christian colleges because otherwise they're going to learn actual facts about the universe and figure out that all of that was like not even close to reality. <laughs> like, guys, enough with this Jurassic Park stuff. I don't see what all the hubbub is. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> all right. I think my cat's chilled out now. That's nice. Nice. So, I mean, did you did you go to church with like the hair growing out and the belly shirt or when did that start? <laughs> no, that didn't start until I got divorced. <laughs> that, that didn't start until I started doing comedy. I uh, mm -hmm. and even after doing comedy, like so the hair, I had just my ex-wife always wanted it short. She didn't want me to grow it out at all. There was a very awkward in between phase of not short, not long. And that was always terrible, and she always hated it, so she was like, get it cut. <laughs> and then when our relationship started falling apart, I was like, fuck you, I'm not doing it. I don't like it. I don't like, you know, going to get my hair cut anyway. It's an awkward social situation for me. I just don't enjoy it. Um, so I just started letting it grow out, and that was freaking like four or five years ago now. And I still haven't, I mean, I've gotten it trimmed up a bit which was a much more pleasant experience than I've had before. Cause it was like, okay, we're not, you know, it's not like chopping all of your hair off. We're just cleaning it up so that it looks even nicer. Yeah. Yeah. I like getting the hang of it. I'm yeah. I think I'm starting to do that. Maybe it's leaving me quickly. <laughs> uh, your first wife, you didn't meet her at homeschool. Did you? 
No, 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 no. <laughs> I had a. Uh, you meet her? I had a group of friends that went to Davidson Fine Arts. Okay. And um, I went to one of their birthday parties, and we met there. So, and that was after I was. Well, I was, I guess, still in high school at that point. And then uh, I got married at 19. <laughs> Not my best uh, idea. No kids? Kids? No kids. Okay. Nope. Married without kids. Yep, for five that years. Early. Just dying to get married, huh? This is what happens when you <laughs> suppress things for your entire life. Constant what did your parents think of that? Um, they were fully on board. My yeah. marriage lasted past when they got divorced. So it was still, you know, I don't know. And then it was like we all started to get divorced because my sibling got divorced first. And then my parents. And then I got divorced. And then my brother got married. And I was like... <laughs> Really? At a time like this? <laughs> Can't you see people are dying and getting divorced? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Left and right. So what did what her parents think of you? Did they like you? <clears throat> oh, yeah. 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 They, I, and her parents were like the nicest people on the planet. They uh, let me continue to like, I was basically borrowing a car from them for years and just using it because they didn't need it. It was old Yaris. And then when we got divorced, they were like, I had just kept driving the car and like, <laughs> they hadn't said anything about it. And like, I went over there to talk to them about it and they were like, okay, well we could transfer the ownership to you for no money or whatever. We'll just give you the car, yeah. but that would mean we can't pay for the insurance anymore. So do you really want to do that? And I was like, Wait, are you offering to pay for the insurance on this car <laughs> until eternity? Because, yeah, we can do that. I'm not yeah, that mad at her know. that I'll turn down free car insurance. <laughs> um, and they continued to do that for months until my ex found out about it and then complained to her parents enough that they were like, okay, well, we have to, you know, it's like I said, at some point you got to take sides and it's uh, your freaking daughter. So I guess change the ownership of the car if it's that yeah. big a deal. Now I see why you got divorced. Yeah, no kidding. A real, a real, uh, real wench, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's so, an easy way of putting it. Uh, that was the ex. You just recently got engaged, correct? Yeah. Yeah. To a lovely young person next to you. Yes. Where, where, where'd you meet this person? Uh, Facebook. Okay. But we had, our paths have been crossing for our entire lives without actually knowing it. She grew up literally like down the street from me, from my house. And then oh, nice. um, the first house that I had moved out into after living at my parents' house was like this huge party house with a bunch of roommates so the rent was really cheap, but it was in total insanity. <laughs> um, but parties every single night. And turns out she was like actually a big part of that like scene and crew that was always hanging out partying. And I just never it we just never so happened to cross until um, after my divorce. And I was, you know, talking to people on Facebook and stuff. And I found her. And so how do kids reach out these days? I mean, how does that how does that uh, initiation happen? You invite her for coffee. You first said, did you go to yoga immediately? I mean, what's the deal? Um, so I was <laughs> already doing comedy, and like I had added her on Facebook. I don't even remember how I started the messages. I don't remember what my was first... it. Uh, it's a dick pic right away. No, no, definitely not. I think she's <laughs> looking it up right now. But um, it was out of the Snapchat. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never used Snapchat because I always, uh, I feel like I just missed that. And I don't, I never really like understood. Snapchat. Yeah, right. <laughs> I feel like most people just use it for cheating. And I didn't want to. <laughs> I feel like you're right. Yeah. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I had already started doing comedy at that point. So it's really easy to be like, hey, come out to an open mic. I kind of suck. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, how did, was that where the uh, the comics with attitude started? Is that that house? No, no, definitely not. No, <laughs> comics with attitude is very recent. So that was, that house was freaking 10 years ago now, probably. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then so what's uh what's the comics with attitude? How'd you get started with that? Uh that was started by EJ Mack. He recently started doing comedy probably last year or yeah, it was last year. So he's still basically under a year of comedy and one of the top comics in Augusta, I would say. It's freaking insane how like quickly he has just started doing this. Yeah, I love his, I love watching him go up there. Yeah, and he new material all the time. I don't yep. know how he does it. Um but anyway, so he was like, you know, there hadn't been any shows because of COVID and everybody had just like shut down and nobody started back up again. And he's just one of those people that just takes initiative all the time on everything and just started talking to Fox's Lair talking to Joe's underground talking about trying to get like paid full on shows going and uh, eventually did. And that's where he started the he tagged it with comics with attitude. And ever since then, that's what it's been called. And the first show of that was insane. Just yeah. packed. One of the best shows of my life too. It's the long, still to this day, the longest set I've ever done. It was like 25 minutes. Oh, so, dang. Yeah. So how long had you been going on stage prior to that? Um, prior to Comics with Attitude? Probably yeah. two, almost three years. Okay. Yeah. We're like, just going to like, how did it start? Like, how did it start? When did you, I mean, because that's a, that's a whole process so, of itself is like right. deciding to go to an open mic and that whole sort of thing. So how right. did that start? Um, well, so I had gotten divorced uh, as most how did you get into comedy stories also <laughs> <Yeah>. begin <laughs> um, cool. way more than I ever expected or like, Oh yeah, I got divorced. And then I was like, <laughs> Hmm, this sounds fun. Um, excuse me, but I got divorced and then I was starting to actually hang out with people again because it was the kind of relationship where you get like locked away in a tower and never get to talk to anyone. Um, and uh, my buddy Dylan every Thursday night would go to Fox's Lair, not specifically for the open mic. It was just so happened to be the night that everybody had off and they would all want to go down to Fox's Lair because it's arguably one of the coolest bars downtown. Nice. And um, we would just hang out there every week and it just so happened to also be open mic night. And eventually I started, you know, thinking about doing comedy stuff and I started I'd been going to Joe's Underground a little bit more and seeing other like real life comedians right there in front of my face and I was like yeah. oh this is a real thing that you can just do and then um one of my buddies showed me a video of him doing stand up and I was like well, I could do better than that I knew it <laughs> I knew that was going to be the story <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> and then uh eventually one night we were there for open mic and my buddy dylan he knew i'd written some material out and uh he was like you gonna sign out tonight and i was like yeah probably in a little bit once the list gets a little bit longer i don't want to have to like go up like right at the beginning he was like oh okay and then he just signs me up on the list and <sighs> puts my name down for me and uh ever since i went up that first time it's just been like a like an addiction Can't so do stop. you remember do you remember the first time pretty vividly or no there is a video somewhere there's a clip i think it was on uh my sibling lilliam's chat uh snapchat actually which surprisingly you know the thing that's supposed to delete <laughs> your stuff after a while it also does the thing where it's like hey you know so many years ago this happened and that popped up on the same day that i had posted about doing my first ever comedy set and uh, yeah, so there's a video of it somewhere, and um, I do remember it being uh, just amazing experience for me. It was like 
you know, like five of my friends and then like the bartenders and one other, one or two other performers that were in the bar, but they still like, I got a couple of laughs probably. I imagine I had to have in order to enjoy the experience, but like, it just, it felt so good that I was like, okay, well, I guess I got to do this for the rest of my life now. No, uh, man, going up there and getting a laugh. Yeah, it's especially because I don't know about you, but for me, like I talk myself out of doing it so many times. Like I'd be like, okay, this Thursday night, going to do it. And then a time would come and be like, ah, next week, you know, uh, that yeah. would happen so often. So, I mean, was that something, Would you were you putting it off or were you just, you wanted to do it and then you did it? Um, well, I had been putting it off for a few weeks, probably of being like, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. And then eventually just getting thrown into it, you know. And well, like you said, it's funny how important it is to like see someone suck at it as mean as that sounds. But if you just see a bunch yeah. of guys killing it, you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be that good. But if you think you can be better than someone, like it gives you enough motivation to get up there. Right. Yeah, and, like, one of my inspirations to do stand-up comedy at all was Bo Burnham. And even now, as a, you know, three-year comedian, I'm still looking at Bo Burnham like, I'm never going to be that clever. I'm never going to be that musically talented. I'm never going to be... It makes me want to quit sometimes. It just... Oh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, I mean, three years, too, if you talk like a seasoned comedian, I mean, three years is still a baby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, still yeah, so. infancy. I mean, who knows? That's the amazing thing about it is like, you know, are you even still going to want to do it in three years, right? Like, or are in three <laughs> years are you going to be famous? In three years, is it going to be like the same kind of path? It's just, yeah. I mean, th just thinking about time over the past however long. But going back to the engagement, I mean, how long have you guys been dating before you popped the question? Um. Well, and I have, she found the very first message that I ever oh, sent her. Here. So here, let me, let me read it. Uh, I said, I said, sup, exclamation point. 25 <laughs> mutual friends was just too many for us to have somehow never crossed paths. Oh, and then a bit uh, oh. the laughing emoji with the little sweat drop, the ah, <laughs> like kind of nervous. I love that emoji i use it all the time um yeah and that that was what started it all and that was oh crap how, how oh no we're not gonna get to i gotta read the reply uh she said not much about to unpack to go hiking so, <laughs> yeah. super uh <laughs> super interesting um oh, yeah. but that was august of when august 15 19 2019 august Damn, 2019 early. And then, Look um, at you. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah. So, when you're early in the day, you couldn't stop thinking about it. Yeah. So, the lesson here is shoot your shot. <laughs> um, now, it was probably, honestly, she just probably showed up in my people you may know. And I just saw 25 mutual friends, which at that point was a lot. There's a lot of times now where it's like, you know, I have 25 mutual friends with somebody and I'm like, I don't even want to add you. Um, <laughs> There's a couple of things in that one message, too. It was like Dang, the insecure tried. emoji to go with the fact that you remembered exactly <laughs> the amount of mutual friends that you guys had. Like, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, well, that's it was well. it was I did an ad and then I send the message instantaneously <laughs> so that it's not like, why put it off? You know, shoot your <laughs> shot. Um yeah. So now with you guys, what's funny is because, you know, my wife and I had dated for years before finally I proposed. And, uh, you know, a lot went into that, just like the pros and cons. And I get my parents have been divorced. So that kind of was affecting, you know, why bother that whole sort of thing. But yeah, right. with you guys, especially, I mean, not that I'm not that having a long hair is like such a rebellious thing these days, but the long hair, the belly shirt, I mean, she's got the dreads and the stuff going on. Like, it seems like you guys are pretty anti society to do something as traditional as marriage. I mean, what went into that? Um, so yeah, after experiencing, you know, like I said, the cascade of divorces in my family and, you know, going through one myself, I wasn't exactly like super keen on getting married again. Um, but like, 
And that's that's the other thing I was about to get to, too, is actually she was the one to propose to me. So oh. she actually popped the question, which was one of the main deciding factors for me in, like, actually getting married again was, like, well, you know, if she's bold enough to do that and loves me enough to do that, then you know what? Yeah. She's like, you know what? He shot his shot. Now let me return the favor. Yeah. Yeah, because in the end, it is like marriage is that like that ultimate loving gesture. And like you can talk shit about it as much as you want and how it's like just a piece of paper or it's like just, you know. Oh, trust me. After going through a wedding, it's a lot of pieces of paper. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of pieces of paper. But um, A lot of green pieces of paper, a lot of white pieces of paper. There's a lot of pieces of paper. But on top of that, it's all, it, you know. The symbol of it. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the ring process like? I was like, do we want to do snakeskin? Do we want to do moon rocks? <laughs> <laughs> she got me. I don't know if you'll be able to see it really. Okay, mm, hell yeah. Not really. It's a, yeah, here, let me take it off. Um, it's a silicone ring. Because I'm an electrician, so it's like the inside of your tits. Not... Huh? Ah, there we go. Ooh, and it's yeah. got Boba Fett on it. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, so I mean, you guys must just that series must have just had you hard as a diamond in an ice storm. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You should see my Boba Fett shrine, my Boba Fettish shrine. <laughs> um, it's a collection for sure. One of my largest, most expensive Lego sets is actually the ultimate collector series of boba fett's ship so damn yeah which i will still call the slave one no matter how unwoke it is yeah screw that dude i mean i'm well never mind i'm not gonna say it but you know what i mean <laughs> i was going somewhere with richard Pryor, and we'll talk about it later anyway yeah. uh as far as the whole wedding process i mean how far are you guys into that like do we have a venue do we have like people picked Wait. out best men maid of honor all that sort of stuff um, so like I have, I have decided on like some of the wedding party details. We also just asked, uh, Skylar Q Andrews last night, if he would be the officiant, he said ah, yes. Wow. So, uh, he may be legitimately ordained by the end of this year. Who knows? All um, right. <laughs> he's always That's been perfect. pastor Skylar anyway. So don't tell me you're going to have it at Joe's underground. No, 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 no. We're not doing any part of this at Joe's Underground, I don't think. Uh, she told me that I have to propose back to her at one point, and for a very brief fraction of a second, I was like, I do have the stage to at Joe's all to myself most of the time. And then I was like, no, no, that's not the way to go. That's not romantic. That's not... <laughs> um, no. Nah. Anyway, <laughs> and, uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, I was trying to think of ways. It has its own. It's such a. It's such a good place. It's such a bad place in a good way. I don't know how to phrase yeah. it. Like it's. It's just. It's that horrible movie that you love to watch over and over again. Like that's what yeah. Joe's Underground is. The word is dive bar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what you that's, want in a dive bar. That's exactly what you want in a dive bar. Is that like you know that bathroom from Saw? The yeah. like a certain musk, you know, the food is like orderable, you know, all that yeah. sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've always been surprised at the edibility of the food in <laughs> Jones. It's surprisingly good. I, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, have you been? Oh, uh, wedding, oh yeah, wedding, wedding. Yeah, wedding. Yeah. So, we don't have, well, we want to do it in the woods somewhere. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we have tentatively picked the date as uh, 4-20-2024, so that it's 4 20 which is also 4 20 backwards. Ah, just want to do it on Hitler's birthday, huh? I see how it is. Backwards. Something good's got to come out of that day, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I said that. <laughs> it is... We got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that'll be that'll be fun. 
And how are you guys uh, doing? Like uh, costumes or straight up, you know, straight up attire? Not totally sure yet. Okay. That it has yet to be decided. That's one thing that, like, that was honestly one of the first things going through my mind after I had said yes to the proposal. I was like, what the fuck am I going to wear at this wedding? Because, like, people I mean, are going to expect, like, half a shirt. <laughs> Boba Fett in the woods might sound silly, but we could pull it off. We could pull it off, right? <laughs> we could pull Although it off. certainly there will be elf ears. So, like, there will at least be that. So your longest set, you said, was, like, 25 minutes um do you have you ever been like just doing early on like do you remember a terrible set have you ever like walked off or have you always like finished the set uh i have I don't, i've never like walked off in the middle i have ended early i would say i don't yeah. know if that is the same thing or not but i always like try and finish out like what i'm trying to do um and there's like my comedy can be very abrasive sometimes or disgusting maybe i don't know what the proper term is but uh, it's for the kinks it's for the kinks yeah a little bit sometimes and sometimes i don't preface it with anything and sometimes it's just not funny yet so i'll have whole sets where i'm like just kind of talking to a gross crowd of people and i'm like i i have since learned and i since like i have actual like prepared stuff now yeah. i have a whole repertoire of material that i can throw out there so i can try a new thing and if that's not working out i have this other thing that i know is like either like a little more tame or just actually a lot more funny or whatever it is to try and balance the sweet and the salty is that how you've done it from the start like have, were you writing out like bullet points or were you writing out like full thoughts uh, so it depends on the thing. A lot of times I feel like the most important parts of a joke are the punch at the end and then like the concept around it. And within that, you can kind of just build whatever it is that you want to do with the joke. And, right. um, I'm also really into Lego and I feel like that is a good analogy for like building a set and building like a whole thing of, and uh, Billy Anderson, the guy, a comedian who came here, taught a class on it, was basically saying the exact same thing. It's like, you got to have bits. You have like a joke here, you have like a punch here, and you've got, you know, stuff that you can rearrange and put into different, or you know, styles or different clumps. And then you take those clumps and you add them onto the other parts and you get like a whole you know, half hour. And then by the time you've got a half hour, you know exactly how to just keep adding things onto it. Yeah. It's very much like free building Legos. It's almost the same thing for me. So, so like, again, not that it's such a, a wild and crazy thing, but it is different. Like the belly shirts are constant. Is that, that's a conscious, like, am I, are you doing it for comedy or do you just enjoy belly shirts in general? Uh, I mean, a little bit of both. I do enjoy wearing the crop tops just because like i've always liked shaking up the status quo or whatever however you want to like phrase that that's not corny or um you're outside the box man outside the box dude <laughs> like especially since i started taking psychedelics i was like oh everybody is wrong <laughs> that'll happen yeah. Nobody, nobody has anything right. So do whatever you want. Nothing matters. It's all a simulation. Like, and um, I what's don't know. Yeah. Uh, what's the hallucinogen of choice? Like, do you have a preference? LSD for sure. Okay. Is my, like I mean, in. yeah. I haven't. I've only ever tried LSD and mushrooms as far as yeah. psychedelics go. So I haven't done like ketamine or well, I mean, I have done um, ecstasy, which I don't think should count as a psychedelic, but right, it a lot of people do. Um, but out of the two, I like acid better just because it's uh, I feel like it's a little more bang for your buck for one. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> you get like eight hours of shit for ten dollars or something <laughs> like that usually 10 15 bucks you get an eight hour fucking experience 
and then mushrooms is like four hours for 40 so it's <laughs> that's a good point yeah I, I always just think of like at, for your first time i just feel like mushrooms are a little less intense because it doesn't last so long so yeah maybe by the time yeah you've had a few you're right maybe acid would but be your preference but also yeah and the thing is like the first time you do them anyway you're not gonna know how long it's been <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna recognize that time is passing True. in a regular manner um but once you get a little more used to it i always say it's kind of like sour skittles like if i do it more than two or three times a year you get a little too used to it you know what i mean oh yeah well and the thing is too like you can get some acid that lasts like into the next day, you're like, God damn, is this ever going to wear off? Like, I'm yeah. worried now. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. It, it's a, So have you had like any bad trips? <laughs> you ask all the right questions. Yeah. So the first time I ever tripped was actually it was on mushrooms or at least what I was told was mushrooms. It came in a Kool-Aid. So I literally you? drank the Kool-Aid. I was 22, maybe. Okay. Um, I didn't start doing literally any drugs until I had moved out of my parents' house. I was like, okay. You're I finally able to legally drink. You're on the shit end of your marriage. No, no. This was still... I mean, it was kind of all a shit end. But it, <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's, it was probably... I don't know. I don't remember it much. A lot of PTSD. But... That'll happen. <laughs> so can't take strobe lights, right? Yeah. So um, it was a lot of us. We had gotten a big old pitcher of Kool-Aid from the person who had told us it was mushroom Kool-Aid. And um, she said, put it into a water bottle, like fill up one water bottle of Kool-Aid and drink that. And that'll be a dose. And uh, there were, I think, seven of us, including me and my at the time wife. And um, one of my buddies who was also married, but his wife was not cool with it. So he was doing it on the down low. Um, and then a he couple was of our other. It up for everyone, I can already tell. Oh, buddy. <laughs> Are you fucking up for everyone? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> he decided since he was, he was a bigger guy too, he was probably getting close to 300 pounds. And, um, he was the one who was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm bigger. I should probably take more, right? So he did a bottle and a half where everybody else did one water bottle. Mm. And um, it was, a, at the beginning, phenomenal experience. You guys Most, outside, inside? Uh, inside, it was me and my ex-wife's house. It was a townhouse. We had a backyard, but we had agreed Nobody's leaving the house. <laughs> gotcha. We're staying in here. Nobody's <laughs> going anywhere. Nobody's driving anywhere. Nobody's <laughs> doing anything. We're just going to sit in here and enjoy our mushrooms. Uh, and we had seven of us and then one person who was not taking them. And this was everybody's first time taking them. <laughs> Did that one person have like everyone's keys and shit? Yeah. But that one person was also like the most timid person of the entire group. Oh no. So not exactly the best lifeguard for the situation. <laughs> and uh, it was really, really fun. At one point I felt like everything was made out. Of, I looked like everything was made out of Lego, which at this point is obviously one of my obsessions. <laughs> um, and the movies are great. Oh yeah, the Lego movies. Yeah, phenomenal. They did yeah. such a good job putting like doing it in CGI, but making it look like real Lego. It and still funny for adults. Oh yeah, yeah. It makes me a little bit excited for the Mario movie, considering Chris <laughs> Pratt is going to also be in it. So yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's no, it's the studio that did Minions. But anyway, mushrooms. <laughs> 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 uh we were upstairs downstairs at one point it was like the tea party in alice in wonderland like everybody's just who's got the time ba -ba -da -ba -da, you know <laughs> just saying nonsense why is the raven laid a writing desk and it 
gets to a point where when somebody says something, the person next to them repeats that thing. And then the person next to them repeats the thing. And then the person next to them and the person next to them. And, the, and it just like goes around in a circle around the living room. And then eventually everybody starts syncing up and it starts getting louder and louder until somebody starts screaming like, ah! and then everybody stops. And then somebody says a thing and then uh, somebody repeats it. And then somebody repeats it. Doing mushrooms with that many people is an experience. Oh God. Let me tell you, it is. Especially when none of you have done it before. And nobody knows what's going on and why is my brain acting crazy and why, you know, like nothing's working right. It's like <laughs> if your brain is a computer, it's like taking a magnet and just sticking it right on the CPU. Like yeah, that's a good way to drive it. It's <laughs> and I, like when you know what it is and you know what you're in for, it can be fun. But when it's seven people that all have no idea what's going on and like it it gets crazy so at some point during that weird ass vocal drum circle of ours uh somebody had mentioned like the word cops or police or something and then everybody starts freaking out about like are the police here to arrest all of us for just doing mushrooms in our own house and like <laughs> Oh no! At one point, I thought there was a helicopter outside shining a light in through the window, and like had to like duck and cover and try and hide, and I was just fucking terrified. Uh. And we eventually got to the point where I was just totally hallucinating. I was not attached to reality whatsoever. I had just visualized in my head or something getting arrested being put in jail no. living the rest of my life in prison until i was like 80 or 90 years old finally getting out and then dying and then waking back up as a 22 year old in my fucking townhouse tripping balls on mushrooms oh my god dude. and it gave me this whole other perspective on life and reality and how like like i had my whole life ahead of me at that point again yeah. and um it was at that same point where the dude who had taken a bottle and a half of them starts also freaking out i think actually the thing that got me out of that hallucination was got him. you out of prison <laughs> yeah it got me out of well <laughs> I was out of prison. I just, you know, <laughs> like eventually consciousness came back to my body and it was him taking a skillet off of the stovetop and slamming it down on the tile floor and shouting, nothing is real. <laughs> and that's That'll the first it. thing I can remember back in reality. Oh my God. Um, and then he starts freaking out about police again and talking about how he's going to go out there and confront them out the front door that is which we had agreed not to go out of and so still uh, have the skillet in his hand no no he had thrown it on the ground he didn't care about the skillet anymore nothing's <laughs> real he was yeah he was gonna go out to the skillet's not real room. yeah he was gonna go out and take them all on himself um at which point one of the other friends who had like obviously the peak was kind of over for most of us and it was getting back to like okay my brain's coming back to functioning now and he was looking out the window he's like dude there's no fucking cops out there you can come and take a look out the window yourself there's not a single cop out there and uh he just didn't believe anybody and continued to try and get out the door so one of the other guys was like trying to hold him back from going out there and he just tosses him over to the side and ends up breaking a picture frame <laughs> all over the floor Oh. And then I am like, okay, dude, you seriously need to stop. Because I've known this guy since I was, like, eight years old. He was one yeah. of my, like, homeschool buddies. So, <laughs> like, he was also Brother. from a family of, like, nine or ten kids. Also, all of them homeschooled. We went to the same homeschool group or whatever. We grew up, like, alongside each other, going through much of the same shit. <laughs> except he handled it in a very different way. And it all came out with the mushrooms. Um, so anyway, I tried to stop him and he throws me up against the wall 
and is like holding me by my neck basically ah. and i have to like get his arm off of me and like try and wrestle him down to the ground and hold him down on the ground and he's like flailing around grabbing for the glass that's on the floor just going totally insane and like saying did he get a piece of glass uh, he was bleeding, but he did not like get any in his hand. And at one point, he like tried to bite his own thumb off, and oh. like it was good it lord, was rough. Yeah. Um. So we ended up. Uh. I. And I'm not. <laughs> this is just part of the story. I'm not super like <laughs> proud of this. Okay, but there was one point when I was like, "Dude, you need to fucking stop, or I'm gonna punch you straight in the fucking face." And then he didn't stop. So I just punched him in the face. Ah. And then you kicked him in the dick. No, I just kept punching him in the face. <laughs> <I just laughs> kept going over and over and over. Oh, uh, God. But no, he, he, we ended up just like tying him up with rope and leaving him downstairs while we all went upstairs to try and recuperate from the situation and figure out what the hell just happened. Because, you know, we're all still on mushrooms. Yeah. So it's still a crazy scenario. And I was like, you know, crying my eyes out. Like this, one of the worst things that had ever happened to me. I just finished living my life in prison. Then I had to beat up one of my best friends. You guys are your best man, isn't he? <laughs> no. <laughs> turned out. no, no, I do not still keep in contact with him. Really? Um, he wow. moved to Korea, which is crazy. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, what you did to him. I mean, what's that? Know, after what you did to him, he had no choice. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was, it was, it was a while after that. But, um, eventually we all like went back downstairs after we feel like everybody had like kind of gotten back to baseline. And uh, this was at like one or two in the freaking morning now at this point because we, I think we had done them at like six p.m. Maybe, yeah, six or seven. And then by like one or two, you're like, okay, it's, I think everything is solid again. Nothing's moving around the walls. I think we're good. <laughs> and we go down there and like try and have a discussion about what just happened. And he just didn't, didn't remember any of it. Yeah. And uh, I was like, I there's, there's no way, dude. Like, there's no way you don't remember. I remember every second of it, and you don't remember anything, really. I don't think that this is that kind of drug. <laughs> have you uh, have you told anything like this on stage before? I still have yet to figure out how to like compress that into a like good cohesive bit, other than just like telling the story, right? Which I feel like doesn't have enough. Um, like comedic beats to it and it's also like just kind of a uh um cautionary tale anyway <laughs> about set and setting <laughs> like don't do them with a bunch of people don't do them with a bunch of people whose first time it is and you know maybe if you have some inner demons from early childhood maybe 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 just hold off or take yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Try a little bit first and see how that goes instead of going balls deep as soon as you can. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like A lot of people think that it's random. Like It's 50-50 chance you're going to have fun, you're going to have a bad trip, and it's like, no. no, there's a lot that goes into it. Like, how you, yeah. where you are in your life, you know, where you are in the moment, like, all that stuff. Right. I've, um, yeah. I've been thinking for a long time, ever since, like, you know, so that was my first experience with tripping. And then my second one was like right as I was getting divorced. And that was my first time taking acid, like seriously. So wait, that and first, the, that time was your first time? The mushroom. Yeah. Yeah. That was oh, my first. No. And I don't let it get me down, man. I don't let, I don't, I didn't well, blame so the mushrooms like, at all. How long after that, before you did it again, that must have kind of made you weary of it for a while. Well, yeah, it, like I said, it was until I got divorced, which is like probably like three, two or three years later, okay. probably. Well, and the other thing was like my ex-wife, she didn't, she was definitely turned off to it. She didn't want any part of it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um. So 
the next time that I really even had opportunity was we were about to get divorced and she was going out of town. So I had the house to myself for an yeah. entire day. I was like, one of my friends that I had just recently made had some and he was like, hey, let's do this together. And I was like, okay, cool. And then last minute he was like, dude, I got to work tomorrow. I don't know if I can really do this today. It's getting kind of late. I was like, late? It's noon. What do you mean late? <laughs> How long does this last? What What am I, I? I don't have any other opportunity to do this. So I still have to do this now and I still have to work tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I ended up doing it, loving it. It lasted forever. I used that time. I had already bought plane tickets to go to California because I was like, I need to do something to get through this whole divorce thing and figure out what's going on in my head. And I've got a buddy that lives in California. So I was like, I'm going to visit him the night before I had gotten super duper drunk and ordered plane tickets to go to California. Didn't tell my boss. Didn't ask <laughs> anybody. It was still like joint bank account money. I was like, fuck it. She's can't, she can't repo plane tickets. Oh, no. Like, uh, <laughs> so I, um, the day that I had taken the acid while tripping, I had texted my boss. I was like, Hey, uh, I don't think I want to make it in tomorrow. And also I need all of the week after off. I'm and kind of going nothing through is real. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then nothing is real. Uh, yeah. Uh, but he was to his credit, a really good boss. Totally understood. He was like, I get it. You're going through a thing. Like, you know, just as long as you come back. So hold up. So one night you're drunk. You're like, I'm, you get the initiative to get plane tickets to California. Well, I had been thinking about to... doing it, but. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't like totally impulsive. Yeah. But I mean, I didn't expect it to be, it was like, I ordered plane tickets for a week from that day, basically. <laughs> Gotcha. So it was pretty impulsive. I was planning on like a few months later. But and then it was after that you went and got the acid? Yeah, yeah, the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that same day you're like, you know what, boss, I need to take some time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And the day before the what had happened when I before I had gotten drunk and ordered plane tickets was I went out. And I had gotten a tattoo on my rib cage that says, I'm not okay, I promise. <laughs> um, Isn't that like a fucking My Chemical Romance song or something? Yeah. <laughs> sure fucking is. <laughs> Good lord. Only my no wonder your father hates you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. He actually came out to my first few stand-up sets because it was like, you know, he had also just gotten divorced. He wasn't with my stepmom yet, who's a very conservative lady. Um, so there was a period of time where my dad was like, you know, he was wearing flip flops and, um, you know, whatever and sunglasses and chilling out. And he was, he was cool dad for a little while. And like, I got tickets um, to Eric Clapton. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, when he was like, when he was dating around, he was, or, you know, like dating people and trying to find somebody that was, he was pretty laid back and he would come to my comedy shows and stuff. And he seemed to like it a bit, but like, I don't know. I think it got a little too, uh, I got a little anti-religious with not, not anti-religious, just sacrilegious, I think is the <laughs> proper term. Well, it sounds like it wouldn't take much to get him up on stage. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think I think you just like slide you right do in. Karaoke probably first would be a little wedge in. You ever mentioned it? No, no, I haven't. I mean, I don't really. Ever since he got with my stepmom, she, if he wasn't okay with all <laughs> this, she is definitely not okay with it. So uh, I'm just. Uh, not even like I don't I don't know, just not even really like a part of that anymore. So, so when did the hosting at Joe start, and is that the only place you host? That is the only place I host, and um, it started 
during COVID. So I think it was like 2021, basically, was like a little bit post COVID. I mean, you know, post COVID, we're never going to be post COVID. It's just a, yeah. it's like saying post rabbit. Um, <laughs> can't, wait just, all, can't wait till the rabbits are gone. Yeah, right. Um, or post mosquito, maybe is a better one. Uh, that would be nice. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's when nice. I think about the rabbits, I think about the Dust Bowl and how, uh, you know, people in Oklahoma were just needing anything to eat and just clubbing the shit out of rabbits left and right. Oh, my God. <laughs> that is not my first thought when I think of rabbits. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I go places. Yeah. Um, rabbit clubbing. That's... <laughs> When I think of clubbing an animal, I think of clubbing seals. I'm not for it. I'm anti clubbing rabbits. Okay. I'm just saying. I mean, you, <laughs> don't let don't let a dust bowl right happen there in the front of your brain, though. <laughs> well, you know, you see it. You see a, a video like that. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. I think my it's first like thought is rabbit one club. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think my first thought is like Wallace and Gromit, like. It's a giant uh, were rabbit in one of those episodes. I think that is the first thing I think of when I hear the word rabbit, and then I think of an actual rabbit, just like a picture of one, <laughs> just sitting I, there. I derailed that a lot, didn't I? Where, yeah, what were we? Even <laughs> we were back at Joe's. Oh yeah, Joe's Underground. So, um, oh, post COVID, post rabbit. Right. Well, so post <laughs> shutdown, I'll say. Yeah. Um, it was Joe's had shut down for months because it was mandatory. They said all bars done. You're closed for probably like two or three months. And then eventually Joe's opened back up again. And um, my buddy Lamar DeFore, I don't know if you've met him. Um, he, I may have I didn't know, I don't know his name. They, uh, they didn't have a host for Joe's because they, the guy who was hosting it had moved to Macon. And, um, are you talking about Marcus? No, it was uh, so Marcus had it. Then it was a guy named Dean Gossett Jr. or Rum Dean oh, okay. might know him as. Yeah. Um, and then Dean moved to Macon, and Lamar took it over. And then Lamar moved to Florida because he was in the military and stuff. And I think he's got family down there. And then um, he handed it off to me, which at that point. I was like, you know, a year and a half in, a whole year of it being during COVID where you can't perform anything. <laughs> so, like, I at no point was ready for that gig or yeah. in no way, shape, or form. But it sort of, like, was the, the, um, the fire, you know, like, like a forge. What is, what is it? <laughs> There's a word for it. It's like... <laughs> I've yeah cauldron maybe no it's not a cauldron it's a the uh the flame uh, yeah it's the oven that you cook metal in <laughs> <laughs> oh whatever those things yeah. are called damn it the kiln kiln yeah it was a fucking kiln of <laughs> like you better start doing this and you better start doing it well because not only is it like <laughs> It's it's one of the hardest crowds is the just the people you know. Just the yeah. five or six people that you know and they've already heard all your material that you already have, so you better be clever about it. Right. Or come up with something new or do something different. And um Yeah. So it really uh I feel like put me through hell to get to where i'm at now yeah i mean in hindsight it seems like although it was rough in the beginning you've only like you're still doing it so you must enjoy it at some point oh yeah yeah more than anything else i've done arguably um i don't know playing guitar on stage is pretty fun so that i sort of half jokingly told lamar the other day i was like i might just might just be a rock star instead this is so much easier now what what elements of your comedy do you feel like you know have you, have you thought about recently like damn this has come a long way like since i started um definitely the confidence on stage is yeah 
it's something that I I will say, like, not to toot my own horn or anything. I feel like I had been pretty good at since the beginning. There were obviously, like, times when I've... It's been ups and downs, and, like, sometimes you just aren't feeling it that night, but I've kind of learned how to, like, push past that, and what, especially once you get up there, and if you can just, like get that first one if you can get that first bit and they laugh and you're like oh my god that that's right this yeah. is why i love this i'm good at this i know what i'm doing i have prepared for this i worked hard to be at this point and you you know let the rest of it rip that initial validation like yes i am funny like it's not just me like i really am funny thank god you know right yeah. Like, it's exactly. not just my friends. It's not just my mom. Like, other people think I'm funny. It's like, thank God. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, this, because anyone who takes the time, some people get up there, right? And they're just like, they don't care as much or whatever. But to just the desire to get up there, clearly, like, you want to do it. Like, you appreciate a presence. You appreciate sharing some piece of yourself. So, the validation of getting up there, it's like, it's like getting on a dating app and actually having people reach out to you, or whatever. Like, right? You know, like, oh my god, I am attractive. You know, it's like yeah. I am interesting. You know, it's just the validation is so nice to have once you're up there. Um, have you had any like? I mean, I know it's Joe's, and for the most part, that's what I've loved about it since I've been down there is how supportive everyone is. Like, it's crazy how supportive everyone is. Oh yeah. But have you had any like like a heckler like just give you a bunch of shit your whole set? Oh yeah. Really? <laughs> I mean. Not so much at Joe's. I don't think it's ever really happened at Joe's. There's been times when, um, like, I've been hosting and people will, like, try and walk up on the stage because they're, like, super drunk and have no idea what's <laughs> going on and have no idea that it's not karaoke and they can't just <laughs> interrupt. Um, but one thing I do feel like I've sort of been good at is, like, those kind of interactions with, you know, people where it's, it took a few times of it sucking and <laughs> like at uh Highlander is probably the best example of somebody heckling me and like literally just telling me while I'm on stage, they're like, get new material. They're like, you've done the same. I heard this last week and oh my God. Yeah. That one's rough. I've heard like, I've always felt like Highlander is a rough one for comedy because everyone, I feel like everyone wants to see music and if you're not doing yeah. music, then they don't care crucible <laughs> that was the word i was looking for it was a crucible ah, okay that's also okay. highlander for sure is a crucible it's like a superheated oven that you gotta just endure and if you can endure it then you'll be tempered and hardened and an actual sword i mean is, um, it, is that just the way it is or do you feel like you've had good sets there i have had good sets there um yeah. and it's it's definitely possible to kill at Highlander it's possible to kill anywhere I believe but there's a lot that goes into it and sometimes it's beyond what you can just do with your voice and words right sometimes it's you know something like you need some sort of introductory thing or you need some way of um getting everyone's attention like there needs to be some loud music going on or an announcer saying like hey everybody and like over loudspeakers that everyone can hear like, hey, we're having a show. Let's do this. You know, <laughs> probably pay attention or getting there beforehand and turning all the chairs towards the stage. It's right. amazing what like little tiny changes can do to just make the entire experience better. Like we at Joe's, I will sometimes try and get there a little earlier to try and put the chairs up towards the front and get people to sit in that front area because you know everybody just goes onto the outskirts of the bar and uh i get it i understand because yeah. until i started doing comedy i was the exact same way and now yeah. now that i am in it and i do it i am one of those people i'll like plant myself in the audience sometimes at a certain spot to, like be like hey guys you know it's cool to sit over here right like you know that's okay I've, uh, <laughs> that was like being homeschooled 
I always like wanted to like try and understand like all of the social interaction stuff. I always knew that I was going to be missing out on that. So I needed to study it harder than most people would. Yeah. And I like figuring out the psychological triggers of like, if one person just sits in an area, it's a hundred times more likely that more people will sit in that area. Monkey see monkey do is one of the most powerful psychological tools in the human mind. It is like seeing how malleable someone's brain is, is just unbelievable. Yeah. Have you ever gone to like an event and you don't really know where you're going when you're driving there and you're trying to find a parking spot and the person behind you clearly also doesn't know where they're going and you feel like you could just drive in a figure eight and they would follow you the entire time. It's just crazy how willing people are to be. Oh, this person know, must know what they're doing. I'll follow right. them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah all so, the time. If yeah. there's ever a line, we just get in it. That's just how human brains work. They're like <laughs> something important is happening. And then it's, even if no one's heckling you, like, and I'm just, I'm not picking on Joe's, but it's just firsthand experience for me. Like during an open mic, if, if you're someone who, you know, um, is just starting out or whatever and on a busy night, like it can get pretty loud in there. Like you said, people come in, they flood to the back. So oh, yeah. kind of like flustered by noise and like people not really paying attention and you can't blame them. Like they didn't pay to get in to see anyone perform. Like they're just yeah. there to have a drink and they don't need to shut up because you're doing an open mic. So, yeah. I mean, to overcome that too, some nights is pretty challenging and being and, able to and, do it is like nice. And like you said, nothing against Joe's because that is literally every single open mic. There are yeah. two types of people that go to an open mic and that is the performers and people who had no idea there was an open mic going on. <laughs> that's the only two types of people. Yeah. And um, that's a damn good point. Well, as my voice cracks, that's a damn good point. I don't, I don't know of anybody I've ever met going to an open mic for entertainment purposes. <laughs> it's <laughs> are there any uh are there any habits that you feel like um you're still trying to squash from when you started out uh well so my biggest struggle the whole time has always been this whole like people telling me that i need to do clean comedy because there's always somebody telling you that you have to do clean comedy and that you have to like clean it up a bit, stop using so many curse words. And I'm like, I don't even like, I could take or leave the curse words. They're not that important. I just have a hard time getting my brain to stop saying them. And, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's the way I talk. Yeah. Um, and then like on top of that, a lot of things that I find hilarious or a lot of things that people find hilarious about me are related to my penis. So it's just, <laughs> I mean, but that's one thing I've always kind of wanted to and admired about people like, you know, Jim Gaffigan or um, John Mulaney, especially is like such a good comedian and doesn't even like, couldn't even be considered like a dirty comic or whatever. Right. Um, but then there's always once again, back to the psychedelic thing, I don't really believe in solid lines on anything. Like, this is clean and this is dirty. I don't... There's always that middle ground, and the whole point of comedy is, like, finding something that does both. And once yeah. you find something that does both, that's funny. Something that's irreverent and somehow benign that... Yeah, I mean, you can have your Dolly Partons, you can have your Janis Joplin's, like, and everything in between. You know what I mean, like. Right. And if you try to, because I feel like I feel the same way personally. I, I'm, you know, what I do, I curse quite a bit. I talk about lewd shit. You know, yeah. it's hard for me even on these podcasts to like. It's hard for me to censor myself. You right. know, so it, it's just the way I've always talked. Like, I, I'm my buddies and I always bust each other's balls growing up. We said things like gay all the time, like. Uh, it's you know it's just boy scouts are you though, kidding you know? me yeah so and that's the the difficult part is um you know when we do stuff if you have a desire to have people know about it you know and put youtube videos up and things like that like 
uh, it's in this place where, okay, some people, maybe a potential employer these days, once I apply to somewhere, is going to want to look me up. And if they see all this shit on my social media pages, like, oh, look yeah. what this guy talks about, you know, do we want? so there's that part of it. It's like, maybe I should censor myself. So I'm not closing all these doors employment wise. But then if I change what I talk about, it's not going to be funny anymore. It's not going to be authentic. So there's that part of it, too. Yeah. Well, see, and ever since I got divorced, I spent my whole marriage trying to be something that I wasn't trying to, like, clean up my act, basically. Yeah. And um, not literally my stand up act, but, you know, <laughs> just. Um, but anyway, trying to do the clean cut sort of thing and like not really, you know, not really being myself. And I decided when I got to force, I was like, well, it doesn't seem like there's any reason to be anybody other than me anymore. And if people don't like that, if my boss or potential boss doesn't like that, doesn't seem like a job that I want to have. If the girl that I'm with doesn't like that, then that's probably not the person that I want to be with and so on. So I've now surrounded myself with people that actually just care about who I am as a person and my own, you know, who I actually am. And if the people that don't like it leave, then okay. Yeah. I, I, you spend too much time trying to be someone you're not and you it's, it's draining. Like it's physically draining. It's mentally yeah. draining. And by the time you get out, by the time you finally get out of it, you feel like you took a shower and you're like, Ugh, I got that ick off me of just always like walking on eggshells and not being who I really am. And you feel like you wasted time. Number yeah. one, because we have such precious little time in this world. So that's a bummer in itself. Yeah. So yeah, it's very freeing to finally, like finally start talking like yourself and acting like yourself and all those sorts of things. And plus, you know, there's a labor shortage these days, so we can't get turned down from too many jobs. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I have a tattoo Okay. Well, Not safe for work, but ah, uh, yeah. Um, Love and it. getting that tattoo was one of those decisions. I was like, this is probably going to prevent me from some job at some point. And then I thought to myself, I was like, and I, I do construction now. So uh, nobody's really super picky in construction about like, if you have tattoos or anything. Right. Um, and that was like the big decision point of like, okay, well, I'm spending hundreds of dollars on this piece of artwork on my arm that I'm not going to want to cover up all the time. And if somebody doesn't like that, if like a boss or somebody doesn't like that, then that it is what it is. And that's just not the job that I want to be in. And um, I feel like that was a really big uh, decision point in my life was getting that tattoo. Now the construction thing, I mean, not to be not to be a dick, kind of threw me off seeing you, you know, being Mister Electrician and having yeah. things and shit online. So yeah, I mean, when did that start? Like, when did you pick up all those skills? Um, so I've worked all sorts of jobs. I worked retail. I've worked food service. I waited tables. I um, taught an after school program for kids. I Dang. did a whole bunch of stuff, and. Uh, the last one I did before construction was I sold cars for oh, two wow. months. I sold cars at Sunbelt Nissan and it was one of the worst employment experiences <laughs> of my entire life. Every time you walk into a car dealership, just throw the, the concept of truth out the window. Just yeah. leave it at the door. Nobody is telling you the truth about anything nobody is telling each other the truth about anything the managers are lying to the salespeople who are then lying to the customers and then the customers because the salespeople are liars have to be liars back and say like oh yeah of course i'll be back and i'll think about it and then you're like you're not gonna think about it or like they'll walk in and say oh yeah i'm just looking around i wouldn't buy anything today and apparently those are the people you go for but <laughs> Like it's just having, having worked at a dealership too. Like you get, there's plenty of those guys for sure. And sometimes it's not even malicious. Sometimes it's just a go along, get along guy. 
like the salesman who doesn't want to bother the service writer with yet another problem on this guy's Hyundai. So yeah. it's like, all right, I'll just tell the guy, you know, it's all good. And they'll come back next Tuesday when you know you should be fixing that problem. Uh, yeah. You know, just shit like that. Right. Oh, yeah. Little shit all the time. And especially time. when it comes to the money, actual money of the car. And you're like, <laughs> you'll, I would, I was a sales guy. So I would talk to this, you know, couple or whatever. And they're like, can you just take the price down at all? We just can't afford it. Blah, 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 blah. And I'd be like, let me go ask my manager the, you know, typical line. You go, you walk around to the office and you talk to the manager and the manager's like, nope, that's it. That's the lowest we can go. That's the lowest price there is. And you bring it back to the people and they're like, well, I guess we'll just have to think about it, which means no. (laughs) And then they go think about it and they come back the next day with a piece of paper from another dealership saying, oh yeah, they offered us this much. They took, you know, $2,000 off the car. And you're like, huh. So you go and show your manager again. And you're like, hey, the people across the street offered the same car for two grand less. And he's like, okay, well, tell them we can do 2,500 less. And then you're like, I thought you said this wouldn't go any lower. (laughs) You're lying to me now. You can tell me that we're lying to them. But please let me know that it's also a lie. So I can know when I'm lying. Um, It becomes becomes like a lie. I mean, a lifestyle at some point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially if you're good at it. And I was yeah. not. <laughs> there was this lady who got busted recently. She would come to work. She was, she was faking her pregnancies at work. She was like a federal employee. And she would like wear a, a pregnant suit and show up every day in this pregnant suit and like call off and like take maternity leave. How many pregnancies did she fake? I think it was at least one. I think she might have been working on her second or third one. <laughs> She would like she would like show you know her uh, colleagues you know stock photos from Google and say they were her kids and shit. That, <laughs> that is insane. crazy. Uh, so yeah, so, I can't just imagine you waking up every day strapping on that suit and being like another day. No, nope. <laughs> no. Closest I've ever come to that was I uh, worked at a warehouse. It was a distribution center, and uh, I was driving a forklift around. So there was the constant threat of maybe being drug tested and I did not want to stop smoking weed. So I got, um, it's called monkey whiz. It's called a, um, it's got a belt to it and like a little pouch of synthetic urine. And I would just strap it to my waistline every day under my pants in case I ever got drug tested. I could just (laughs) pull out the little hose and do that instead. So I have the whole fake penis and everything. No, just a tube. Okay. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, but so hated selling cars. <laughs> Worse. Yeah. yeah. Worse. I like gave somebody like a 25% interest rate one time on their car. He was like 19. He didn't have any credit. And I was like, that felt awful. Oh. Um, I sold a guy a car one time. He, it was a pre-owned car. He, he had shown up at the end of the night I was like, he was just kind of like looking at the car, just walking around on the lot or whatever. And my manager was like, you go get him. And he, at that point, had known that I kind of suck at this. And he was like, just send the newbie out there. He'll just drive him away or whatever. I don't want to have to deal with this the rest of the night. Um, Because we were about to close. And the guy wants to test drive it. And because I'm, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed, I'm always like, yeah, let's go for a test drive. And it's like <laughs> 10 minutes before we fucking close or like it was like 30 or 40 probably. But that's still not enough time to sell somebody a car. Right. It's a yeah. Long process. Um, so anyway, he comes in there to get the keys for the test drive. And my manager's like, why don't you just show him how much the car costs? And I said, well, you said you got to put their hands on it. You said that I helped sell the car. And he's like, just show him this piece of paper, please. And just tell him exactly what I am going to tell you right now. And he shows me this piece of paper. It does not have the price of the car on it. Oh, the piece of paper has the monthly payments that you yeah. would be making on the car on it over yeah. what different periods of time. And he circled the cheapest one which is the longest terms in green Sharpie or whatever, put dollar signs next to it. 
<laughs> literally like the cheesiest bullshit I've ever seen in my fucking life. And then uh, tells me to take it back to him. Say, if you want that car, you can have it right now. These would be your monthly payments. And just if he asks you any questions about how much the car costs, just tell him it's this much a month. Don't say how much the car costs. Tell him it's this much a month. And I was like, all right, what do I have to lose? <laughs> so I go in there and I do exactly what the manager said. And this motherfucker just signs the piece of paper. Of course right then did. and there, no test drive, doesn't know how much he's paying for the car, wow. signs the agreement. And I was like, I that was the most money I had made there. It was a ridiculous margin. They had traded in that car and Sunbelt Nissan had bought it for maybe $13,000. Sold it to this guy for like twenty seven. dollars no, That's the thing, like, because I thought about car sales before too. And it's like, you know, just like with attorneys, it, it's not like you can't be an ethical car salesman or an ethical yeah. attorney. But I have to believe the really successful ones are few and far between. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like clean comedians. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's about probably about the same ratio of clean comics to honest car salesmen. You know, and I was thinking about that with uh, like when you download an app and they want permissions to all that different shit, and you just mm. hit agree. Yeah, you know, like yeah. I feel like we all we all just hit agree, no matter what it says in that damn thing. And, oh, every time. Yeah, with the assumption that like, oh, well, if something bad happens, I could just sue. It's like, you're not going to sue anyone. You don't have the money to sue anyone. Right. What, what are you talking about? The only time I get a, li a little weary is when it's like, do you want to allow camera access? And I'm like, wait a minute. What are you? <laughs> what, what is in this app? <laughs> so have you, uh, have you like um, traveled to different like Columbia, Atlanta? Have you done different spots outside of town? Oh, yeah. Um, and really quick. So I hated the car sales and construction was the thing that you could get into in like two days you go in you interview and then you have a job the next day so that was what got me into construction was just it was easy and then i loved it so oh well, perfect yeah, I mean, yeah you didn't do anything like that before like your dad wasn't into construction or anything no, i had helped um so one of my neighbors when i was growing up he would flip houses and he would renovate them and sell them again and i helped him a couple of times but other than that no oh, um, so you back so to I, knowing your neighbors yeah yeah yeah, that was at my childhood home, too. I was, like, 15. Well, that's pretty sweet. I am yeah. jealous of that. I'm about as handy as a, a, a seal. <laughs> they don't have hands at all! Um, but so... it's funny as one, too. Anyway. Yeah, um, spots outside of town. How have those gone? Yeah, so I do Columbia a lot. I go to Art Bar mm. frequently. Um, and by that, I mean like every other week or less sometimes. But it's it's a long drive for five minutes of comedy. Um, yeah. So I've done New Brooklyn Tavern in Columbia as well. And then um, I've actually got a show in Macon. Uh, ah. It's the 27th of March. I don't know when this... I mean, I guess it's live now, right? So, but... Yeah, it'll, be out, it'll be out soon too so plug it away cool yeah um march 27th it's called uh funny how an abstract comedy experience it's at <laughs> um ah damn let me i don't know oh, no, now you're not getting paid no no oh, no <laughs> just lost the meundi sponsorship uh startup studios in macon georgia okay on the 27th um, which I post flyers for all my stuff all the time on my Facebook page, my Instagram. So, um, but I've got that. I actually went to Austin last year for mm -hmm. about a week and hit up every open mic that I possibly could, which was like two or three a day. Damn. Um, I did a entire episode of my podcast with me and Brittany and we just went over the entire trip while we were still there on the last day and did a whole podcast episode about it. So you can That's check that awesome. out too. Hell yeah. I mean, yeah. What is the podcast called? Uh, Cry Havoc spelled H A V O K. not C. Cry Havoc okay. available. I mean, is it on Spotify? All the it's, the, um, it's on Spotify, iTunes, Apple, or um, Google 
podcasts, all the regular podcast streaming, and then a bit of it is on YouTube, but I am super lazy with it. So my um, coworker Christian offered to do the the task of editing it for making going from audio to video because I don't have any okay. video for it at all. So yeah. it's just a you know putting the picture on there over top of the audio and then pushing it to YouTube. So there's like seven of them on YouTube, but I have like 30 something episodes now. So and it is such a pain in the ass. It's like, I got to put it here. I got to put it there. Yeah. You know, my Instagram is so outdated, you know, for this show. It's unreal. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. I forget to post my podcast on Instagram all the time. Like yeah. I looked, I posted this most recent episode that I just did because I had a little hiatus, meaning I got lazy and didn't post one. <laughs> um and uh i just posted one recently and i posted it to instagram and i was looking back through my instagram and the most recent one that i had posted past that was like episode like 12 or something 10 or 12 yeah it was ridiculous so what's uh what's the uh general theme of cry havoc um it's pretty much just like me interviewing people that i know talking to yeah. them no um specific like through line other than my general consensus on reality and trying to figure out what other people think about the same thing. Um, love it. I love it. It's just hard. I mean, for people who have like a straight of the line niche, you know, like this one's going to be about baking or right. yeah. going to be about, you know, true crime. Yeah. More power to you. But I, just, my brain is too everywhere for that. I had somebody at Joe's tell me the other night, he, I told him about my podcast. He was like, what's it, you know, what is it about? Which is such a weird question for a podcast. Now, aren't most of them this? Aren't most yeah. of them just like talking, you know, two people talking to each other, or, you know, more maybe. But the, um, he said, you gotta have, you gotta have something that like, that brings people in a reason why they went to go and see the show, like a reason why they decided yours over other stuff, like a theme or something that they're there for. Like I'm here to see a horror thing or a comedy thing, or I want to know more about movies or I want to know philosophy or whatever, which, you know, thinking about it, arguably, yeah, that's how I found a lot of podcasts, but most of the ones that I really, really enjoy the podcasts that I actually listen to on a weekly, regular basis are the ones with people that I like listening to. Yeah. It's the personalities. It's the, you know, the characters basically. And in the podcast world, like just saying the name gets so like, uh, again, but I mean, Joe Rogan is the number one podcaster in all of podcasting. Yeah. I mean, talks to literally everyone. So, I mean, <laughs> clearly it's working for someone. I don't feel like you have to have, yeah, you know, Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, but right, uh, you know, but I do feel like that can help um, spread it around a little bit, especially at that point. You can like, it's all about where you can post it online, right, and how you can hashtag it and how right. it trends or whatever. And Dungeons and Dragons trends a lot better than Cry Havoc, whatever the fuck that shit is. <laughs> That's true. That's true, but I just I just really appreciate like the idea of organic growth, like barely yeah. promoting your shit, you know, barely doing any of the gimmicks and the bells and whistles and paying for uh you know yeah. boost on Facebook and all that stuff and just having people share the hell out of it because they enjoy it. Like that's right. what I like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which you know, I'm at like ten to twelve listeners a week now, so hey. we're getting there. Those are 10 to 12 hardcore listeners. I know, right? They'll probably even listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm lucky. If I'm lucky. Well, dude, I mean, you've been super generous with your time. I really yeah. appreciate it. We're almost two hours into this thing. I Hell love yeah. if you, uh, I mean, do you have any other shows coming up? Go ahead and give us uh, social media handles, all that. I do. Um, Joe's Underground every single Thursday at 930 is about the start time. I'd say, you know, like sign up is variable but we usually have a pad there um but that's joe's underground 9 30 thursdays the list got... is the list is always fun because usually number one stays open and then people yeah. sign up starting at like four uh -huh. and then there's a gap until like eight it's always fun right um 
so I've got that. I've got the show in Macon at Startup Studios on the 27th. And then I've got a show coming up on April 8th at Joe's Underground. And that's going to be a Comics with Attitude show. That's CWA. Okay. And um, that one should be a... That one's going to be fire. Gonna like, be that's going to that's gonna be lit. Uh, yeah. It's... <laughs> if I had to guess, probably going to be even better than the first one, which was Joe's was packed. There was no room to even stand. And it was one of my favorite sets I've ever done in my life. So um yeah, that's all I've really got scheduled. The well, Fox's Lair also is doing an open mic for strictly comedians okay. on this Wednesday. So the 20 something of March. Um 20 yeah. Yeah, this week Wednesday and that's 8 p.m. I believe at Fox's Lair, which, like I said before, one of my favorite venues. They, you really got to check them out if you haven't. I haven't. I need to go down there. If I've seen some pictures, but I do need to actually physically yeah. be present. It's a whole vibe. Cry Havoc available everywhere you find yes. podcasts. Cry Havoc everywhere you can find podcasts. And then my Instagram is Havoc Comedy. And then Facebook, Andrew Havoc. So, And a YouTube page? Uh, yeah, Havoc Comedy as well. Perfect. Awesome. Yep. Well, dude, thanks a lot. Hopefully we can do this again soon. I really had fun. Yep. Sounds good. Hell yeah. Awesome. Everyone have a good night, and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye.